Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, welcome back to another episode on the evolution of fiqh. Let me start with the name of Allah, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, in the name of Allah, all praise be to Allah and peace and blessings be on his final messenger, our most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the previous episodes, we had uh, several uh, topics covered. Uh, all of this is an introduction to fiqh. We called it evolution of fiqh, but we did not mean that it is evolution of the schools of fiqh. It is of evolution of my and your fiqh. Uh, it also included talking about the schools of fiqh and how they evolved. We talked about the meanings of fiqh, linguistic and terminological meanings. We talked about the scope of fiqh. We talked about other aspects of fiqh as well or as are other aspects which would be of benefit before you embark on the actual study in Gafiq. Uh, we said that uh, when we started our talk, we said that uh, people expected of us to talk about purity, fasting, prayers, and so on. But there is a lot to know before we embark on the studying of fiqh, the different topics, the different chapters of fiqh, whether they have to do with transactions or acts of worship or other uh, titles. We talked about the importance of learning fiqh and we said that the learning of fiqh is mandatory in some cases. It's preferable in other cases. You need to learn the fiqh without which you cannot practice your religion, without which you cannot perform your duties and abstain from the prohibitions of Allah. If you <clears throat> have uh, ambitions and aspirations to learn more, then you are encouraged to learn more. And say, this is a speech from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ himself, and say, oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. If the Prophet ﷺ needed more knowledge, then we all need more knowledge, particularly in our day and time, particularly in uh, uh, times of confusion and uh, times of fitna, tribulations and trials. We do need as much knowledge as we can attain. So it is mandatory to learn the, the necessary fiqh and it is preferable to learn more and to learn more about the deen in general. We did then talk about the source of fiqh, uh, the revelation being the source and we said that the madhahib do not mean that there are uh, various sources other than the revelation. The madhahib uh, did not add or delete from the deen of Allah which was complete before the Prophet Sallallahu departed from this life. Allah said to the uh, Prophet and the believers during his life in the farewell pilgrimage, Today I have completed your religion for you, perfected my favor upon you. And I have chosen for you Islam as your religion. But the Mazahib compiled that great heritage, uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, reconciled between uh, reports that could seem to some people who have some lack of knowledge contradictory. Uh, they uh, arranged the, the different topics and put the knowledge in chapters, titles, and subtitles, and so on and so forth. They deduced rulings of matters that were not particularly mentioned during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims when they moved out east and west came across different experiences. The fuqaha or the jurists were able to deduce rulings for these matters, new matters from the general principles of the fiqh or sometimes from the detailed uh, scriptural evidence by using their reasoning and their comprehensive uh, knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We did then talk about our position from the Madhahib and we emphasized that in our approach to the Madhahib we should make sure that we are not dividing the Ummah. 
We make sure that we're not overlooking, we should make sure that we're not overlooking uh, or ignoring the heritage, the great heritage of ours in the Mazahib, which are the work of thousands, thousands of the most notable, distinguished, uh, and uh, scholarly uh, imams of Islam. And at the same time, we should not make this a force of uh, division or a divisive uh, force in our ummah. We then talked about uh, some uh, principles from the fundamentals of jurisprudence and from the legal principles, fundamentals of jurisprudence, usul al-fiqh, the legal principles, al-qa'ad al-fiqhiyya, that could be of benefit for us in uh, understanding fiqh. Uh, we then talked about the concept, uh, uh, or before that, in fact, we talked about the concept of moderation and extremism, whether it's extremism on the right side called excessiveness or extremism on the left side, uh, which is called laxity. Uh, last uh, episode, we were, we were talking about uh, the uh, source of rulings in uh, fiqh, which is Al-Qur'an, Al-Sunnah, Al-Ijma', which is consensus, and Qiyas, which is making an analogy. And uh, we particularly uh, uh, talked about uh, Sunnah in more detail uh, because a Sunnah is subject to uh, an offensive attack uh, from the people who want to alter the religion of Islam, who failed to uh, alter the Qur'an and now they want to alter the religion of Islam uh, from the gate of uh, a sunnah or denying the authority of a sunnah or casting doubt on the uh, authenticity of uh, uh, some of the reports or the reports of uh, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So we talked about the authority of a sunnah, we talked about the preservation of a sunnah, and we talked about the classification of the sunnah according to the origin, according to how the Prophet expressed it, and also uh, according to its relation uh, to the Qur'an, and according to its legislative role. And we said that the sunnah does not mean preferable acts. The sunnah means the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ, and the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ are vast. You can deduce from them mandatory acts, preferable acts, permissible, uh, uh, disliked, or uh, prohibited. Any one of the five categories can be deduced from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, by the end of the last episode, we were talking about some challenges uh, that face the sunnah and the people who um, uh, live uh, by the Sunnah, the first one is the uh, uh, the doubts uh, that uh, tr- people some people try to cast about the preservation of the Sunnah, and we said that Allah promised to preserve it. Um, we uh, then wanted to talk about uh, how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala preserved it, but we didn't have enough time. So today, inshallah, we will start with talking about how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala helped the Muslims preserve the Sunnah. The scholars of Islam uh, uh, who collected the Sunnah, uh, you, you hear names like Al-Bukhari and Muslim, and we said yeah, uh, the other time, the last episode, we talked about the writing of the Sunnah starting from the time of the Prophet wasallam, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and other Sahaba who started to write uh, during the time of the Prophet wasallam. <clears throat> so... Uh, the 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 uh, professional writing uh, started a little later, uh, or the, the the effort was um, boosted by Omar ibn Abdul Aziz uh, by the end of the uh, first century after the Hijra of the Prophet وسلم, and by the time of Imam Malik, it was already very active. Imam Malik himself is the one who collected Al Muatta which is one of the great collections of Sunnah. He was born in the year 93 after Hijrah and died in the year 179 after uh, Hijrah. Uh, the scholars of Islam did not just write their reports like this. You know, Imam Malik did not just hear that the Prophet Wasallam said um, something and he just wrote it. 
they made sure the report is authentic. They exerted their maximum effort into uh, critiquing the reports and making sure that they are authentic. They did this through something that was not known to humanity at that time. It was not known to humanity. It was not practiced in any religion or uh, in any writings of the history prior to uh, Islam. You'll find this quite clear, quite obviously if you make some comparison between the uh, preservation of the Bible and preservation of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We're not here making a comparison between the preservation of the Bible and the preservation of the Qur'an. We're, we're making the comparison between the preservation of the Bible and the preservation of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The writers of the Bible are uh, people who did not see Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, the, the, the New Testament, the most ancient manuscripts of the Bible that exist date to somewhere between the uh, 200 after Jesus to 300 after uh, Jesus, peace be upon him. We, we, they don't have chain of narrators. They do not, period. They do not have any chains, uh, chains of narrators. So the most ancient manuscripts that were written, there are no chains of narrators uh, whatsoever in any one of them. Uh, besides, the Bible was written in a different language. The first time it was written, it was written in Greek. Jesus, peace be upon him, never spoke Greek. He spoke Aramaic. The Sunnah was written in the same language spoken by the Prophet wasallam. was written by people who lived in a Muslim state who protected the heritage of the Prophet ﷺ from alteration. It was uh, written by people who use the, the concept of verification of reports, verification of reports by studying the chain of narrators. If you are from the third generation and you tell me the Prophet ﷺ said so and so, I will have to ask you, who told you? Because simply, you cannot report from the Prophet ﷺ if you did not see him. So you have to tell me so-and-so told me who was told by so-and-so. Because if you're from the third generation, you cannot just tell me that someone from the second generation uh, reported from the Prophet ﷺ. There has got to be someone from the second generation reporting from someone from the first generation reporting from the Prophet ﷺ. So there has got to be continuity in the chain of narrators, continuity. Any interruption at any point in the chain of narrators will deem this hadith non-authentic. The, the scholars would consider the hadith to not be authentic. The scholars, because of their scientific accuracy, they did record these ahadith. They did not omit them. They recorded these ahadith. They recorded them and they graded them as weak or not authentic because of their scientific accuracy. Also because someone else may report the same hadith from a different chain of narrators, which could turn out to be an authentic, non-interrupted one. The, the, the narrators themselves have to be accurate and trustworthy. If you lie, you, ca you cannot be uh, considered uh, uh, you cannot be considered a trustworthy person to take the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ from. If you uh, do not abide by the uh, by Islam in general in your life in front of the people, then you cannot be considered a trustworthy source for the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But if you're very trustworthy, yet you're forgetful or you're not accurate, or you may not have a good understanding of the language, or you may not have a good understanding of the deen, and you get confused, and you, or you make mistakes, then you will still not be accepted as a narrator. You will be considered uh, a weak narrator, and the scholars of hadith, they have their very scientific, detailed grading of all uh, the narrators. When we come back after the break, inshallah, we will have more talk on uh, this particular issue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs> Allahumma 
من المستغفرين واجعلني من عبادك الصالحين القانتين واجعلني من أوليائك المقربين يا أرحم الراحمين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about the preservation of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and we said that Allah used the scholars of Islam to preserve the sunnah. They were able to use a very good system in the verification of reports that has not been precedented uh, before Islam and any other religion. Verification of uh, reports by verifying the chain of narrators, requesting that there should be a chain of narrators to start with, making sure that each one of the narrators is accurate, exact, uh, and trustworthy, and making sure there is no interruption between the uh, narrators until the Prophet But it was not only about this, it was also about the report itself. So many, t many people think that the scholars of Hadith, uh, they only looked at the chain of narrators, and they did not look at the text of the hadith, which is untrue. The scholars of hadith looked at the text of the hadith as well as the chain of narrators. If the text of the hadith is in conflict with another hadith that has been established as authentic or with the Quran, then the hadith would not be considered an authentic hadith. There would be shuzuth in the hadith, which basically means the hadith is in disagreement with another report that is more authentic. Uh, there is also a look at the language of the hadith. They looked at the uh, context of uh, the hadith uh, and they compared it to the life of the Prophet wasallam. So if uh, certain terms were used in a hadith that were not quite common during the time of the Prophet وسلم, or were not used by the Prophet وسلم, then that would cast some doubts about the hadith and then the scholars would pay uh, more attention to this hadith and, and uh, critique it uh, some more. So it was a very extensive process by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as he promised. As we said in a previous episode, Allah promised, He said, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra. Verily, it is we who revealed the dhikr reminder. And verily, we shall protect it. So, as Allah promised us, He pr protected the sunnah by using us, uh, by using the Muslim scholars. Uh, to uh, preserve the sunnah of the Prophet it, This teaches us that we should not, uh, we should not be uh, pacifist. We should not say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of things and we don't need to do anything. We do not need to help this ummah. Uh, we do not need to revive the deen of this ummah. Uh, to help strengthen this ummah because Allah will protect this ummah. Yes, Allah will protect this ummah, but Allah will use people to protect it. Allah promised to preserve the Qur'an and the sunnah, but Allah used the memorizers of the Qur'an and the collectors of the sunnah and the memorizers of the sunnah to protect the Qur'an and the sunnah. So the question is not about whether the deen will be protected or not or the deen will be preserved or not. The question will, whether you will be one of those used by Allah for this uh, noble uh, task, or not. If you, if you are not, then you missed a great opportunity. So I think that we should be all comfortable, sincere Muslims should be all comfortable uh, regarding the authenticity of the sunnah uh, and the preservation of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the other challenge that faces the implementation of the sunnah and the practice of the sunnah in many of our communities and societies is uh, the so-called modernism. And many people uh, have a corrupted understanding or perception of modernism 
or even the word civilization. People use the word modernity or modernism or civilization out of context. What is meant by civilization? How could you be civilized? If civilization is about uh, writing, which is one of the definitions of civilization, it's about the developing of a system of writing, then Islam is, is the religion that promoted and enhanced uh, education and literacy and writing uh, and so on and so forth. Is, if the civilization is about manners and ethics, that is in complete agreement with Islam. If civilization is about uh, a government, like a central government versus chaos, then that is Islam. That is what Islam promoted. If civilization is about uh, technological advancement and scientific advancement, then that's what Islam promoted. If civilization is about, is, is about sexual permissiveness and promiscuity, then that's not Islam. And that's not civilization either. That's not the definition of civilization in any book, in, in, in any like uh, decent book, in, in any uh, history book. Uh, they don't define civilization as uh, uh, mingling between men and women. They don't define civilization as shaving your beard. That doesn't have anything to do with uh, civilization. Civilization can sometimes be defined as urbanization, living in the city versus living in the country. can be sometimes defined as having a central government and a uh, system uh, of ruling uh, versus tribalism. Uh, it could be sometimes defined as the uh, civilization proper as far as the stages of civilization, uh, savagery and barbarism. Uh, and then the, the last one was civilization proper and uh, the, the uh, development that uh, transformed humanity according to those historians to civilization proper was the development of a system of writing through which humanity can uh, transmit uh, their experiences and their uh, intellectual uh, production from one generation to the next. If that's what civilization is about, then that's what Islam uh, pro is promoting, well, that's what Islam is promoting. But many people understand modernism and civilization to be the superficial, the superficial uh, manifestations of Western, uh, the Western uh, civilization or the Western uh, culture. Uh, to be honest with you, with you, it's not the shaving of hands and it's not the wearing of uh, short skirts that made the West advanced and developed. It, it is the perfection of work, it is the respect of uh, uh, promises and, and the respect time and they manage their time very well, they perfect their work, they are very uh, hardworking, etc. They have uh, certainly problems in, in the Western civilization uh, that are extensive problems in the civilization. But what made them advanced doesn't have anything to do with their religion, first of all, because when they were uh, abiding by their religion, when they're practitioners of the religion in the Middle Ages, they were not uh, advanced at all. In fact, in the Middle Ages, the Muslims were, were the advanced nation. They were, because the Muslims were uh, abiding by their religion, the Muslims were practicing their religion. And then they were advanced in the Middle Ages, and they were certainly much more advanced than Europe. Even when they were defeated in the Crusades by uh, the Europeans, they were still more advanced by the Europeans. They, they earned the admiration of the Crusaders themselves who were able to go back to Europe with concepts that they have not known before. Uh, and even soap is, uh, did not, has not been known in Europe until the Crusaders came to the Middle East. So m many of us uh, in the East are a bit confused about the, this uh, the concept of civilization, the concept of modernism. And certainly you may find this w within our families. There are people who think that, you know, growing your beard is, is uncivilized. What does this have to do with civilization or modernism? What is, what, how could it impede me to have a beard? 
a beard is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu In fact, it is the command of the Prophet sallallahu He said, grow your beards. أَطْلِقُ الْلِحَى وَعَفُ الْلِحَى وَفِّرُ الْلِحَى These are all statements from the Prophet sallallahu about the growing of the beards. How could this impede me from using the computer? How could this impede me from driving a car? How could this hinder me from uh, being a good chemist? or engineer, or whatever. There, there is no conflict. The conflict is an imaginary one. It's in the minds of some people who lack understanding, who do not know what civilization is about, or who think that if we want to be modern, then we will have to take the superficial manifestations of modernism as practiced in the West. The, the same people, the very same people, they are the people who do not who can uh, 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 break their uh, promises, uh, the same people who do not perfect their work, the same people who are lazy when, when, when they go to work. They just, they just took the shaving of the beards and the wearing of a necktie and the wearing of a short skirt as civilization and now we're civilized. This is not what, uh, what civilization is about and this is not what got Europe and the West in general to where they are as far as advancement and uh, technological, scientific advancement and so on and so forth and as far as prosperity. So uh, the, the thing that we Muslims have to be clear on is that there is no conflict whatsoever between our religion and the true understanding of civilization, the true essence of civilization. There is no conflict between the good aspects of modernism because we should not have zeal for any phase or any period of time. There, were, there are good and bad people at every period of time and in every uh, uh, phase or stage of the human life uh, the, there are forces of evil and forces of good. So we should not have zeal for a period of time whether it is the past or the uh, present or even the future. Well, you, you should be able to identify the truth and follow the truth. Identify that which is good and follow that which is good. Take from our time the good aspects of it. Take from the Western civilization the good aspects of it. Technological and scientific advancement, if they are uh, going to help humanity, uh, to help the prosperity of he mankind, that's good then we use this part. We do not have to use the other parts. It's not a whole package. You should not take it indiscriminately as a whole package. This has been propagated, by the way, by some of the so-called thinkers in the Muslim world. If we want to get to where Europe is, we have to take the European culture and the European way as a whole package. Do not pick and choose. We do not pick and choose from the Quran only, but for many other things, we do pick and choose. We pick and choose that which is good and we leave that which is not good. Therefore, uh, dear uh, fellow Muslims, brothers and sisters, uh, you have to be clear on the definition of civilization, the concept of civilization. Do not be fooled. Do not be tricked by anyone who tries to raise some conflict in your minds between any of the sunnah of the Prophet and uh, civilization because there is no conflict. Islam is the most civilized religion. Islam is the religion that promoted all the good aspects of civilization, the true civilization, not the imaginary uh, one. I think that we're about to, to get done here and uh, we will have to uh, defer talking about Sunnah versus Madahib, Sunnah versus uh, Bida. Uh, to a different episode, inshallah. Uh, I will see you then. And until I see you, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.